Good afternoon. Um, my name is Adam Toos. I'm the director of the European Institute at Columbia, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event on the EU's response to the corona crisis, uh, preventing uh, the great fragmentation. Um, I'm delighted to welcome um, our two speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, Marco Buti, who is head of cabinet of the, in the, for the European Commissioner for the Economy, uh, Paolo Gentiloni. Um, before joining uh, Commissioner Gentiloni's team, Marco served for more than 10 years um, as Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs at the Commission. And prior to that, he was an economic advisor uh, to the President of the European Commission, Romano Prodi. Our other speaker is Nicolas Veron. Uh, Nicolas is a senior fellow at Bruegel, uh, the Brussels think tank, which he helped to co-found uh, almost 20 years ago. He is coming to us today um, from his current post as a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, DC. Nicolas works on financial systems and financial reform and also on current developments in the European Union. Thank you very much to both Nicolas and Marco for joining us today. Uh, we've had the pleasure of welcoming Marco Buti to the European Institute every year for the last five years. Um, usually at a time in the fall, which coincides with the annual meetings of the IMF in DC. Last year, we met Marco and I um, just before the new European Commission, headed by Ursula van der Leyen, took office, and we discussed the economic priorities of the new Commission. A lot obviously has changed in the time since then, um, and we're looking out on rather different questions, rather different challenges at the current moment. And it's a fantastic opportunity and a real pleasure, Marco, to have the chance to touch base with you and to discuss uh, where Europe has gone and how it has been coping with the crises um, since uh, we last met. We chose for this event a title, Preventing the Great Fragmentation, which draws from an article published by Marco Buti in Box EU just before the EU agreed on uh, the recovery plan this summer. I'll ask Marco and Nicola to tell us more about the risks of fragmentation within the EU, how these risks can be avoided and what are the conditions for the recovery plan to succeed. After the presentations by Marco and Nicola, we'll have a first round of discussions entre nous, and then we'll invite you as members of the audience to put questions to us. Please send those questions through the chat function on the right hand side. Um, I'll be scanning that as best I can, along with Sharon Kim and Francois Carrel Billard, who, as you know, are the people who really make the European Institute work and tick throughout the year. Um, you can also, if you like, avail yourselves of the uh, blue hand button, but that's really for experts. The most obvious thing to do is really put a question in the chat box, and I will then pass it on to Nicolau and Marco. So I look forward to a great discussion. We'll run until quarter past, uh, quarter past one. Uh, Marco, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, um, many thanks for having organized this. As you said, uh, I have a tradition of coming over. Um, and I, it's a tradition that I, I plan to continue uh, and in person next year, which is also uh, the, the best wish for, uh, uh, for everybody. So, um, no, thank you very much again. Uh, I think it has always been a pleasure to exchange views with, uh, uh, with you. Um, um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today and uh, also um, saying big hello to uh, Nicola, um, who has uh, um, uh, contributed uh, very substantially over the past years to shape our thinking on uh, a number of matters, uh, economic and monetary union, banking union, etc. Now, for, the, uh, for kicking off, I have prepared a few slides, which I think Sharon would manage centrally. Um, voila, so here we are uh, indeed uh, uh, preventing the great fragmentation. You mentioned this uh, Vox uh, column that I published before the summer, uh, and I was asking there um, uh, how to make sure that the, um, the present crisis uh, after the Great Depression of the 1930s, uh, the Great Recession uh, um, following the financial crisis uh, post-2008 would not be remembered as the Great uh, uh, Fragmentation and, let's say, the conditions for doing so. 
Now, uh, we can go, Sharon, to the first uh, uh, slide. I think the, um, a natural way to start uh, here, and by the way, um, you will see, and um, you mentioned my tenure as Director General of DGF in for you know, many years, so I have gone through the, the financial crisis, so I, uh, I have a natural reflex to uh, um, relate what is happening here to what we did or what we did not during the financial crisis. And my uh, feeling is that mutatis mutandis, a lot can be, um, can be learned from there uh, to do things better uh, this time, and also to learn why the response uh, is uh, uh, different this time around than was during the financial crisis. Now, okay, you take here the, um, this, is, this comes from uh, the, uh, basically um, the autumn forecast that we published last week, the European Commission. Um, and what I have done here is uh, to um, take the profile of a um, of, uh, number of countries, uh, so the larger countries of the Eurozone, and also you can see the dots uh, uh, there, the little square, uh, relate that to, the, to what happened uh, during the financial crisis. So, the dots was for the euro area. The, the various lines here, the various colors, is for the member for the member states uh, now. So, and what you can see, I say more more than double the the, the size, uh, is basically okay. This uh, uh, um, shock here uh, led to a much sharper downturn than during the financial uh, crisis. Now, uh, out of this. Uh, uh, picture here, I draw essentially four conclusions. Okay, the first one is that uh, uh, we are not undergoing uh, what one may a bit foolishly have to say hope for in the summer, which is a linear exit from the crisis. So we are in now in the second wave of the pandemic, and I say a bit foolishly because uh, if one looks, uh, and here I'm talking to a very distinguished historian, if you look back uh, um, to the um, uh, crisis uh, pandemics in the past, uh, there has always been a second wave, always. Now, in certain cases, it is uh, um, milder. In other cases, it's actually um, stronger than the first uh, wave. My very casual look at the, at the data and is an extremely casual one, so I don't claim any scientific underpinning. I have also the feeling, by looking at the episodes, that the second wave before the winter tends to be worry, uh, worse than the first one, the first wave. I think this is, uh, again, uh, it is just casual observation. I hope to be wrong in the present, uh, in the present case. Um, but you know, having the winter in front uh, is, uh, is 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 a clearly an issue in terms of, of uh, 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 controlling the pandemic. So the first one, no linear exit. The second point is that this is clearly a shock that is common in origin, but it is uh, um, uh, it is uh, highly diversified, highly divergent. Uh, divergent in terms of outcomes. So one dimension of the fragmentation is uh, uh, this one. The, um, the uh, third conclusion is that uh, by the end of 2022, which is the, the period covered from, uh, in our autumn forecast, the euro area will, will not have gone to the, back to the level of GDP of 2019. So there is an element of persistence here, which is important. You don't see it specifically here because I don't picture the uh, euro area for the um, for the current uh, for the current years. But you can, uh, you know, if you if you do a, a weighted average of the countries, you can see that that is the, that is the case. So uh, end of 22 is not going to be for the euro area uh, as a whole. Finally, and I think is a very important. Uh, element here um, and you can if you can look at the little squares on the side of the of the picture what i do there i take according to our own forecast 
autumn forecast, the uh, level of GDP in 2021 compared to the level of GDP pre-financial crisis, so 2008. So I take the longer term perspective, looking backward. And, and there, what you can see is that to take the two extremes, um, Germany is 12 points ab ab you know, above 2008. Italy is uh, uh, considerably below, so minus nine points. So there is, between the two countries, over 20 points difference uh, accumulated uh, over time. And we know that uh, clearly Germany had a much better financial crisis and Italy had, had a much worse one. So what I'm um, uh, stressing here is that beside the cyclical divergence, so what the short run, the short run, there is, this is superimposed onto a structural divergence, which is, I think, a very potentially worrying uh, perspective. So this is, these are my, let's say, four, um, um, elements which come out of this uh, uh, of this slide here, and uh, uh, the dimension of fragmentations here are portrayed in terms of uh, uh, relative position of countries. Um, but you can uh, you can actually have uh, dimensions of fragmentation which are much more let's say micro than this, but very very important nonetheless. Uh, you have uh, fragmentation between sectors because some they start to talk about uh, a K-shaped recovery. So with some, and we have seen, you know, online uh, digital, uh, you know, booming, then you have other types of services uh, uh, actually collapsing with the little prospects of uh, reviving the same way they were, um, uh, they were before. And there is also a dimension of fragmentation between generations. I mean, studies, uh, of the financial uh, crisis show that uh, the loss of human capital uh, during the shock actually will not be recovered over the lifetime of, uh, of, of these youngsters uh, uh, in particular. So this is the, um, the fear of Greek fragmentation that uh, I am, uh, um, uh, you know, try to highlight uh, here. If you go to the next slide, um, what I have done here is uh, in a very condensed we show how the EU uh, has, uh, the EU as a whole, has reacted to the, um, uh, to the shock. I recall that, uh, again, during the financial crisis, there was too little too late and withdrawn too soon um, in terms of fiscal reaction, hesitations at the, uh, at the outset also on the part of the, uh, of the ECB. Here, there must be, there has been a much more massive uh, um, reaction. What you can see the national here um, is, uh, um, uh, I have divided here between fiscal and liquidity. I put a, a little bit, uh, you know, pushing my luck a bit, the ECB also into the liquidity side. Uh, let's not um, quibble about that, just to add two columns uh, available. So um, national measures uh, in terms of fiscal effect uh, 500 billion for the for the euro area also this is about four and a half percentage points of gdp uh, and uh, uh, liquidity is about uh, 24 percent of gdp at the eu level uh, we have the three programs uh, uh, of cheap loans that's why they are in the liquidity side here uh, sure which is to help essentially short-term uh, work schemes and su support um, uh, skills and and and, uh, and the workforce, the ESM pandemic uh, um, uh, program, which is there um, in principle, it has not been activated yet, and the uh, and the EIB interventions, and then we have the uh, the you know the most important one, which is uh, next generation EU, and within that uh, 750 billion, within that the core of it, which is 90 percent which is the recovery and resilience uh, facility. Um, you see in terms of cheap loans, 360, in terms of grants, 390. I put here 390 plus because the 390 was the agreement that was achieved at the European Council back in, 
July, and the plus is uh, what is being uh, negotiated with the with uh, the uh, Parliament, which reinstated uh, some of the cuts that uh, the um, especially two uh, common programs that the uh, Council had uh, um, you know had done. So uh, and then we have the ECB with a PEP. Uh, program uh, thousand three hundred fifty billion. So you can see that this is shapes up uh, as a as a very sizable response. In terms of the fiscal, by the way, um, the US and the E and the Euro area they have roughly the same increase in the in the deficit, about eight percentage points uh, in twenty twenty. Um, they start from uh, uh, you know different levels, so the they, uh, in the in the US uh, they go to 15 plus, 15 plus uh, percentage points of GDP because they started from a very large deficit but the delta is about eight points for both clearly the composition is different because for uh, for the EU it is roughly half and half between um, actual measures and uh, automatic stabilizers in the US we know the automatic stabilizers are much uh, smaller so it is more of um, discretionary measures so this is uh, uh, let's say a quite sizable uh, response but, and by the way it is not portrayed here because uh, of uh, because of this an aggregate uh, table but you have had this in uh, in the eu response a um, um let's say distributional element which focuses the resources very much on the country's uh, worst hit so the, for some of of the countries there is a several percentage points of GDP you know, uh, in double digit. Um, so over 10% of points of GDP, um, which, uh, which uh, will come from uh, next generation EU. So we can go to the next uh, uh, slide. Um, so why have we uh, reacted in a different way? And you know, hopefully um, what uh, um, what we have learned during the financial crisis helped uh, in this. At least that's my hope and the way I uh, look at the um, at the measures uh, taken. What I have done here, I have tried to condense the main lessons as far as you know, um, as I, as I can see from the financial crisis, and attributed a very um, personal uh, uh, ranking and plus and plus is. Uh, um, in terms of the relevance for the for the current COVID crisis, I think what uh, um, I mean the first uh, the first line is a very important one, uh, and I, um, I'm sure um, uh, Adam uh, in my presentations in the past years I mentioned uh, in um, that had the financial crisis started with Ireland instead of Greece, uh, we probably would have been uh, here in a wholly different story. Uh, so what we have here, this is seen as an exogenous shock. Um, and the argument of moral hazard plays very little role. I mean, there was at the beginning someone who tried to say yes, but had some countries uh, created the space for responding uh, by behaving better in terms of fiscal public finances, it would be, they would have a stronger uh, possibility to react. But this, it did not hold water, that story, uh, really. So the nature of the crisis played an important, um, uh, an important role. Uh, if you scroll down there, there are, um, I don't want to describe the whole uh, thing, but there are three lines uh, which are related to fiscal stance and the policy mix. And, uh, and it is, the first one is that a certain amount of risk sharing in EMU is needed. Uh, that, that can come either by the national budget or by the ECB balance sheet. And that what uh, essentially the second way is what happened during the financial crisis. I think, uh, in, um, you know, uh, especially after Karlsruhe, difficult to put the onus also on a, on the, from a legal and political uh, standpoint all on the ECB. Second, uh, just below monetary policy cannot be the only game in town and early withdrawal of fiscal stimulus uh, um, tends to be very costly uh, in the face of a large shock. And finally, achieving an appropriate fiscal stance, trying to do only by a coordination of national policies rather uh, than on a vertical way between the center and the, 
uh, and the national is um, is uh, is very very difficult. So I think we have if you put all these three lines together, I think uh, this underpins very much what we are trying to do uh, now. We are trying to have a more balanced policy mix. So the ECB is clearly at the forefront, but it's not the only game in town. And fiscal policy plays, uh, I think, an important role also in the articulation between uh, uh, the center and the national level. I remember, I mean, I, I wrote a paper for the, uh, you, some of you may remember the Sapir report 2003, at the time, um, it was uh, it was a paper on uh, uh, which was dubbed, well, the title was uh, towards uh, a European budgetary system, which described at the time, you know, over 15 years ago, uh, precisely the articulation between the national budget and the EU budget that is coming through uh, uh, now. Uh, so this is, um, let's say, the, what we are trying to do. Um, very final uh, uh, comment on this report. A bit en passant, but important also considering that this is a transatlantic seminar, is um, the geopolitical uh, considerations. So I think there, is a, there has been an increasing awareness in Europe that um, having an export driven uh, model, relying on the others to uh, dig us up uh, from the, the hole we are we are in is not a good idea not solving um, in a decisive way problems actually weakens us geopolitically and i think this has been um, you know we have, they have been painfully aware of what has happened over the past years so i think some of the elements of of a concrete and decisive response um, would also increase the role of uh, the uh, europe in global governance and that was uh, you know, before the elections. I think it's be, it will remain relevant also after the US election. So we can go to the next one. And here I have tried to, um, um, you know, to let's say, let's go back to, to uh, a famous quote that uh, everybody uh, dealing with European matters has heard uh, at least once. And it is Jean Monnet, one of the founding fathers of Europe which, uh, and you see that they are in, in inverted commas, Europe will be forged in crisis and it will be the sum of solutions adopted for those crises. This is, comes in the autobiography of Jean, of Jean Monnet. Now, the uh, implicit or even explicit um, uh, answer by Jean Monnet be, uh, in articulating this uh, was that um, Europe will be always the, uh, and so more Europe will be always the answer to these crises. Uh, it will be always the right answer, and it will be always accepted by the by the citizens. These three assumptions are not warranted any longer. So, and here I then put the money compatibility test, uh, and I also leave it a bit to you, if maybe for the discussion to apply it. Uh, to the response to the financial crisis and to the current one. I mean, we need to have, let's say, three dimensions of coherence, which are uh, uh, through, which, through, through, through which filter the, um, the, the policy response. One is economic coherence. Is it the, what uh, we are doing, is it an effective response to the crisis? An institutional coherence is subsidiarity respected meaning that action taken at the right institutional level. And then there is a, a political coherence. Is our, our citizens ready to support what we are doing? So if you go through this, and I look in particular at, uh, um, uh, let's say, the economic analysis of the crisis, I think the, your book, Adam, uh, is, um, uh, let's say, quintessential in that. And uh, you can tell us through your also historical analysis, whether this uh, three-pronged filter is satisfied or not. Okay, during the financial crisis, clearly there was a deficiency on the three dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, was it an effective response for the reasons that I, I argued before? Fiscal, fiscal, monetary delays, too little, too late. It was not 
and uh, uh, clearly the an optimal response. On terms of institutional coherence, I think one could uh, uh, also argue that uh, um, subsidiarity was not respected. I think there was uh, very much a uh, put your house in order first, risk reduction first, risk sharing later, maybe, which I think was not the uh, right response. And also in terms of political coherence, uh, um, I mean, in terms of a, a, and citizen support, Clearly, uh, it was not supported by the... Uh, and if you look at the um, uh, latest uh, um, uh, vintages of Eurobarometer, including the very latest ones uh, um, on the response to the crisis right now, I think there is a much more support uh, for what we are doing now. Also, and it's important to notice, also in the frugal countries, if you look at the Ask the Population, uh, whether they support what we are trying to do. Also, in redistribu redistributed terms, I think you have an overwhelming support by, by the population of what we are trying uh, to do. So, this is um, um, my Jean Monnet compatibility test uh, to go through your, uh, the filter of, of our discussion later on. We can go to the next uh, slide, uh, which is my final one and a bit in the, a provocative uh, one. I'm what I'm trying to do here is uh, to try to capture the uh, why uh, in political terms uh, we are giving a response which is different than uh, than the case so what are the what are the uh, you know the movement of the countries in uh, in this uh, political space and the political space one is the responsibility solidarity axis the y uh, axis here so responsibility also in terms of risk reduction solidarity risk sharing and on the x-axis along the supranational so community method versus the intergovernmental which is the um the uh the more the uh, let's say intergovern intergovernmental relation by uh, member states rather than you know joining up in uh, uh, according to the community method so in essence even though the two are blurred um, what dominated in the financial crisis was a creditor rule, so much, pretty much on the responsibility axis up, and an intergovernmental um, approach. So uh, you may remember uh, Chancellor Merkel's Bruges speech um, uh, when she coined with the union method. That was a gentle way of, uh, say, intergovernmental, uh, basically. Um, so you jump from there uh, to today, I think I can see at least uh, two movements here uh, of, of the two largest uh, countries. So Germany, I think, uh, accepting to move into a more supranational community base. That's why we are trying to uh, in, um, you know, carry out the response through the European institutions and the EU budget. And um, uh, taking into account much more the uh, solidarity considerations beside the, uh, the so the risk sharing beside the risk uh, um, reduction, um, pretty much in a, in a let's say in a self enlightened um, um, principle. It's not uh, it's not it's not uh, that uh, generosity here plays uh, and all of a sudden we have become uh, all goodies. Um, it is a self-enlightened, self, uh, an enlightened self-interest, um, considering a much more um, uh, insurance-based view of solidarity. So you, uh, okay, now you help now, but in the future, should um, uh, you know, should the U.S. Hopefully not with the next administration, but um, pursue the tariff uh, and the trade war and the uh, you, may, you know, Germany with uh, with uh, a more export-led model of growth uh, could be, you know, more vulnerable than other countries uh, who are now, for the moment, into the debtor uh, side. So, what I I'm sure I said it last year, um, the debtor creditors divide today is not a good prediction for the debtor creditor divide tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, I think having an insurance based is a uh, you know enlightened self-interest. 
I think France also moved uh, into the supranational camp. I think the, and this is my final word, in order to respond to the big question, which is, um, is what we are trying to do uh, a big one-off or a change of paradigm in European integration, uh, helping to prevent a great fragmentation I talked about at the beginning. So what are the conditions in order for, for the second perspective to happen? So something, a more structural break rather than a huge one-off. I think uh, that will depend on, on the one hand, uh, Germany remaining in that camp, in that quadrant, also on EMU-related matters, uh, banking union, capital market union, for instance, uh, Nicola may talk about this uh, later. And second condition politically is for Italy and uh, Spain to climb up on the responsibility ladder. Uh, so these are the are my conclusions. I don't want to talk about that uh, um, Poland and Hungary, which is uh, occupying uh, um, the heads of state and governments uh, probably right now in the teleconference. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Marco. That was, as always, fascinating, illuminating, um, very clarifying to get your view on, on the comparison. There is also a brilliant essay by Marco from earlier this year, extraordinarily timely. I think it came out in, what was your piece about lessons learned from your yeah, body maker yeah, yeah. in Vox EU, which, which I'll, I'll put in the chat actually for folks to, to check out because that I think forms the backdrop to his remarks. Uh, a really a, a wonderful essay, which unforgettably starts with an extensive quote from Blade Runner. Um, a fitting testament perhaps to the horrors that uh, Marco witnessed as CG Ecofib. Anyway, uh, Nicola, um, I look for, forward very much to your, to your reactions and your comments on, on the last uh, year of development in the EU. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Adam. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to speak after Marco. As usual, this was uh, extremely thought-provoking. Uh, I loved the Monet slide particularly. And I think um, talking about fragmentation is really a way to uh, get a sense, as this set slide of Marco's suggested, uh, of how different the uh, response to this crisis has been from the previous one. Uh, and I think fragmentation is exactly the right lens through which to look at uh, policy response effectiveness. Uh, the previous crisis was all about fragmentation in my book, more than about fiscal sustainability. And this crisis could have been about fragmentation, but the uh, imperative of uh, spread compression and fragmentation prevention has been understood from the very beginning by policymakers with, uh, from my perspective, spectacular results. So essentially, I will argue uh, briefly, uh, uh, because I want to keep time for interaction, that next generation EU is, uh, to paraphrase the president-elect of the United States, a big freaking deal. Uh, it's a game changer for the European Union. And I was very struck when the uh, next generation EU was announced on uh, July 21 uh, by the contrast between the market reaction and the reaction of the commentariat and media um, uh, articles, uh, you know, Brussels press corps, basically. The Brussels press corps and commentariat were all about, you know, this is difficult, it took four days, the frugals are uh, do, doing what they're doing, and uh, there are many procedural hoops, etc. And the markets were like, okay, this changes the game entirely. And you saw the very significant reduction of spread. And actually, if you look at Italian spreads, they are lower now uh, over German 10 year bond spreads, they're lower now, now than at any moment in the past 10 years, uh, which I think is very spectacular when you look at the gross prospects of Italy and the first slide of Marco, uh, which gives us a big bleak picture economically and by implication in terms of Italian debt sustainability, and still we have lower uh, bond spreads uh, than any time before the Eurozone crisis, uh, until, uh, since before the Eurozone crisis. So we get union bonds, and the game changer is not just really this, I mean, it's by implication the size of the program, but it's really the funding, the fact that the European Union will issue union bonds 
I'm not calling them euro bonds, but I think it would be apt to call them euro bonds. Um, the current jargon says union bonds in significant quantities. The issuance by the European Union is not entirely unprecedented, but the magnitude of it is unprecedented. And this is fiscal federalism. Uh, basically, now we get, uh, as part of the structure of the European financial system, a layer of union bonds that will uh, be recognized, is already recognized as safer than most national bonds. And it's not fanciful to believe that at some point uh, they will be recognized as safer than any national bonds uh, in the European Union. Of course, we can uh, discuss at length scenarios about, you know, is it a one-off? Uh, what will be the future volumes? What will be the ratings, uh, discussions, etc. Uh, I'm basically taking it for granted that this is a real deal, but I'm sure we'll come back to this uh, in the Q&A. It's different from what many people in the current debate call safe assets, because, I mean, from my perspective, union bonds are safe assets, but many people in the current debates have uh, shifted the meaning of safe asset, and for them, safe asset means something that would be even bigger, because it would be an assumption by the European level of at least part of the uh, stock of national debt. Uh, whether you call it a bailout or not is a matter of semantics, but uh, the current coded language suggests uh, safe assets being more than what union bonds are providing, if I get it right, and Marco will can correct me if I, I don't. Um, safe assets understood that way are less uh, in line with the vision of fiscal federalism and uh, subsidiarity than union bonds are. So from that perspective, with union bonds, we get to something closer to the fiscal federalism of the United States, where states issue their own debt, but are subject to a tighter discipline uh, because they don't benefit from a promise of assumption of their debt going forward um, in, uh, by the federal level. In the US, of course, the assumption of the debt was the initial um, creating event of the, of the fiscal, of the federal uh, sovereign level by Hamilton uh, in that famous deal in uh, the room where it happens. Uh, but, uh, but then it was made clear in the 1830s that um, the federal level would not assume uh, state level debt any further. Uh, and, uh, and that's the system we have now. I think the European system is getting close to that with, of course, a much smaller federal level than in the US and much more uncertainty about uh, financing of the federal level. But basically, it's the same architecture when you think in terms of federalism and uh, subsidiarity. The, con the implication is the juniorization of national sovereign debt, uh, which means that, you know, uh, to some extent, it creates an additional factor of credit risk in national sovereign debt because there is less uh, expectation of bailout uh, in case of problems. Uh, I think that's a feature, not a bug. The, this is market discipline as we want it. And it doesn't imply further fragmentation precisely because the impact of that juniorization is more than offset by the reduced redenomination risk, by the reduction in the uh, perceived risk of eurozone breakup. So I think it's a very good deal, both from the perspective of stability and from the perspective of market discipline, uh, because you have more market discipline, less prospect of national bailout, of the bailout of national sovereign debt, but you have such a reduction of redenomination risk that the uh, net effect for sovereign spreads, at least in the short term, is extremely positive. And that's what I have mentioned about Italy. So what are the next steps? And I'll conclude on that because I've promised to be uh, succinct. I mean, obviously we'll have a number of debates about the volume of issuance, whether it stays at the current cap as in the uh, next generation EU deal or whether further uh, needs for EU level intervention will generate more issuance. So there's a big question mark about refinancing. Uh, how will this debt be refinanced? At this point, of course, it's advertised as a one-off. I don't think the market takes that, that as face value. I think the market is right not to take it at face value pretty obvious that um, refinancing it with more union debt is probably going to be easier than either reimbursing it with EU revenues 
or reinversing it with national uh, contribution. So refinancing going forward makes a lot of sense, but as we know, this is kicked into the very long grass because of long maturities, and Marco will tell us, of course, that this question um, is not answerable, or maybe answered negatively, but ultimately that's the same um, for the foreseeable future. The debate on own resources is extremely difficult. Uh, that's normal. I think it was a perfectly apt and wise choice by the negotiators not to be very definitive about own resources, but just giving indications and leaving it for further negotiation. And the German presidency has you know, uh, made utterances that they wanted to uh, finalize a deal on own resources during their presidency. This, of course, will not happen. Uh, some elements of own resources may be clarified, but not to the magnitude that would be needed to reimburse the next generation EU uh, union debt. Again, I view that as constructive, a feature not a bug. And uh, I think it is uh, only a matter of time that more powerful uh, options will be discussed for own resources, which is uh, euphemism for European level taxation. Um, in the future. But I, I think the negotiators have created a framework where this discussion is a discussion over the next years rather than over the next months, and I think that's wise and apt. The implications for banking union are massive, even so it's been another choice of the negotiators not to speak about banks at all in the next generation EU deal. So it's not part of the deal that any of that money can be used for stabilizing the banking system. But the risk sharing is there, and it will have massive uh, implications going forward for future discussions on banking union. I'm now speaking longer than I expected to, so I'll stop there. Just saying that um, institutional reform, of course, is also implied because, you know, taxation and rep representation. Uh, but I think this, this also has time to unfold, and there is no necessity of treaty change in the limited framework of time going forward, which I think is also a good thing, but I think the discussion on own resources inevitably will trigger discussions about institutional uh, setup of the European Union. And again, I view that as a good thing. So I'm, I'm full of praise for uh, the work that policymakers have done this year, both the ECB initially in terms of spread compression and then the wisdom and vision, particularly of Angela Merkel, but the other uh, negotiators in council as well. I'm optimistic that the deal will be found maybe uh, to the detriment of the uh, rule of law mechanism, but I think it's a price worth paying. Uh, and uh, I think 2020, despite its bad reputation, has been a very good year for the EU so far. Thank you very much. Nicola, thank you very much for those uh, succinct and, uh, and fantastically interesting comments. Marco, do you want to come back on anything that Nicola has raised so far? Otherwise, we have a string of questions accumulating in the chat. Mm -hmm. Or maybe just uh, just a couple of words. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, we are too much on the same page uh, to be uh, you know overexcited. Uh, but I think uh, the, um, the the remarks by Nicola were very 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 welcome. Um, let me my, maybe just uh, uh, just a couple of words really. One is on the safe asset uh, uh, issue. Um, I think uh, the. Uh, um, I mean, they, if safe asset is equated to eurobonds and eurobonds is equated with the assumption at the EU level of uh, um, you know legacy debt, I think this is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we are we are mutualizing the future, not the past. You know, this is a, 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 is what we are trying to do. That's why I like uh, my, it's more again uh, looking at Adam is more of a, a euphemism, but uh, I, would, I like to talk more about a Rooseveltian moment uh, uh, rather than a Hamiltonian moment. Uh, if Hamilton is, uh, is seen as, uh, as the, that assumption of the you know, debt of the you know, Southern states. Um, the, uh, what is Hamiltonian is the chance to build uh, something which would be eventually would be uh, akin to a, uh, a European treasury. Uh, I mean, we have seen already a foretaste of this in the issuance uh, uh, two weeks ago uh, uh, of the um, 
first uh, uh, bonds under the sure program uh, so the for the short term work as i mentioned which was a fantastic success with oversubscribed 15 times uh, um, where you can tell that there is uh, first of all high confidence in what we are trying to do with all the it seems that uh, markets are able and hopefully they are right to look through the fog of the difficult negotiations and the political vagaries to look at the essence and it was a huge, uh, a huge success uh, on, from, that, uh, from that viewpoint. So, um, and I think we are equipping ourselves as commission to, uh, to issue then the big, the big deal uh, next, uh, next year. So up to 750. And it is uh, all this, as uh, Nicola said very rightly, I mean, it is uh, basically, um, you know, to an order of magnitude between 15 and 20 times more than what we have done in the past, all European institutions included, you know, EIB, uh, ESM, uh, Commission in the past, and so on, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is the and the, uh, and I agree very much with um, uh, Nicola also that this has uh, you know a fundamental relevance for the working on financial markets. I think it will underpin the international role of the euro with the link to the geopolitical role that we are. But for that, we'll have to go back to the chantier open in the in the banking union and capital market uh, capital market union and i fully agree finally on the way he characterizes the the net impact of generalization of national debt co uh, compared to the redemption uh, and the redenomination uh, risks and you know the markets are clear the second one prevails massively compared to the to the first one and we have seen the impact on the you know, on the spreads that he quoted. I stop here. So thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Nicola. I can see two very interesting questions in the comment, but I can't, I can't resist um, pushing you a little bit. I mean, I share your enthusiasm and, frankly, um, amazement at what happened. Uh, after all, we should remind ourselves that as late as April, the signs did not look good at all. In fact, as late as the first week of May, they didn't look good at all. Um, we shared some email communication at that time and, and it was clear that the mood was very grim. So this has been a key turnaround. And I, I really like Nicola's point about the force of the market movement in July. In fact, as a historian, it makes me reconsider the role of markets altogether in the crisis as an earlier stage. Um, because um, it seems to me, if you go back to 2011 as well, there was, there was big money on the sidelines in 2011, which if there had been a deal available could quite easily have uh, piled in behind the solution, which ultimately Mario Draghi then sketched out over the summer of 2012. So I agree it's a formative moment. <coughs> I want to come back to the politics. We have a question from Peter Linseth, which is very sharp in the, in, the, in the comments. But I want to actually ask a more basic question first, just so that you, we could get your view, <coughs> which is exactly how much of the future have we agreed to share in fiscal policy terms? Clearly one of the key elements of the the politics of the summer is to park legacy issues as far as possible, to take them off the agenda. Um, but even setting aside the question of the manageability of Italy's debt level and the role of the ECB will have to play in presumably stabilizing that, a large part of the fiscal burden of stimulus into next year will still, will it not, fall onto national government budgets. Um, where deficits continue to accrue and debt levels continue to rise in terms of the standard measures of debt sustainability. Um, is that a misapprehension or, or um, is that element still something that, as it were, about the future, not just the past, remains a considerable, a considerable challenge? Do I, um, I take this, uh, uh, Adam, yeah. uh, Nicolas may come in with his, with his views. I mean, I have to say that uh, I have seen many calculations mm -hmm. of people who have tried to discount the future uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, what uh, has been uh, uh, put forward uh, as uh, loans. So this will be repaid by the member states, mm -hmm. clearly. Um, the advantage there would be uh, for, for those who benefit uh, from uh, from you know lower uh, lower interest rates because of the better rating of the EU compared to compared to them and second I think not to be disregarded um, the fact that uh, 
uh, we lower the pressure on primary markets. We know that uh, mm -hmm. uh, the ECB intervenes and uh, cannot do otherwise uh, because of treaty requirements in the secondary markets. So you may, uh, you may have uh, uh, situations in which uh, coming up with national uh, uh, issuances, uh, uh, with bouts of issuances uh, all, all at once, um, may under certain you know, fragile conditions uh, be problematic from a, from a market uh, uh, viewpoint. So having the possibility to take out at least part of this um, uh, issuance from the primary markets, I think, has, uh, may, have a, may have a positive, uh, a positive impact. And uh, there has been then, obviously, at the end of the day, um, there will be rollover. We don't know. There will be new resources. Uh, uh, let's see. I think all resources uh, and um, so taxation at the EU level, some, for, some form or another, is going to be an important element. If you are trying to build a European treasury, you need to have the two sides of the, uh, of the budget, so including the revenue. Um, you know, the revenue side of what we are trying to do that, and I, in that I agree fully with, uh, uh, with Nicola, the Atom, to take a little bit more time. We are going to come forward in the course of next year with proposals on new own resources, which actually align, try to be aligned with the, um, you know, cl climate transition. So carbon border adjustment, uh, ETS, etc. We'll come back to that uh, in the future. So, but what are, well, these calculations, so look, discount in the future, I mean, they seem to be, people seem to discover themselves as, uh, you know, fully Ricardian. Mm -hmm. um, so you discount the, the, the whole stream in the future, you're talking about here until uh, 2058, you bring it up to the, to the, to the current uh, situation, then you show through that, that at the end of the day, the benefits for, for uh, for a number of countries are not so great uh, mm -hmm. because they have to be repaid. Even even the, those receiving a lot of transfers now will have to, at a certain point, contribute a good their good share uh, in the future. But I think this is uh, disregards fully the fact that you cannot discount the future with the same uh, uh, rate as you discount the the present and the and the short term. So. Uh, so I think, yes, uh, the issues will remain. Obviously, responsibilities uh, will, um, uh, will remain at the national level. It is part of the climbing up on my y-axis uh, in mm -hmm. the final, uh, uh, you know, in my final slide uh, on the part of, uh, you know, high debt countries. But I think nonetheless, uh, uh, if everything goes in that direction, I think in the direction we have depicted, I, I think is um, uh, implies uh, you know risk sharing for the future, which is uh, you know a sizable one. Nicola, did you want? To Adam, uh, yeah, just to Peter's uh, question, um, you know, I, I think. So let's spell Nicola, out what the question is in case people yeah, so can't the see the chat. The question was: um, Is the Netherlands, by insisting on a strong rule of law mechanism, ironically acting as an objective ally of Hungary and Poland in driving the ultimate approach back toward an intergovernmental direction? Um, I will, we will only know when uh, we have the final decision, right? I mean, this is what will reveal the negotiators' true preferences as opposed to their postures. Uh, and, you know, at this point, we're in the phase of pull and push uh, that I think it's difficult to read from outside in terms of what the actual intent of the different players uh, is. And there was a tactical move, obviously, by the German presidency to call a vote on, um, on, on their uh, compromise with the European Parliament. And so we could see the opposition of those who oppose. Uh, it's not the end of the process. Uh, and the good news is that there is such a win-win interest, um, if I can put it in those um, trivial terms uh, <laughs> associated with more trivial uh, pop culture these days. Uh, there's such a win-win interest in uh, finding a deal that uh, the markets certainly are very optimistic that the deal will be found, uh, and uh, I concur. I think the, the, the question, of course, is how much will remain of the rule of law mechanism. Mm. But I think it, it is ultimately, from my perspective, quite likely, and I'd like to have any comment from Marco, of course, on this, 
that the um, community nature of the mechanism and the fact that these are union bonds and not intergovernmental bonds uh, issued by some special purpose vehicle, a la ESM, um, that I expect to remain in the final um, deal. So what exactly the Netherlands uh, is seeking at this point, I think we'll only know when we have the uh, result of this ongoing negotiation. But, uh, but, but I don't see, I mean, if your priority is the rule of law mechanism, I see reasons to be worried. If your priority is union bonds, I don't see much reason to be worried now. Marco, maybe you want to comment. Uh, Nicola, let me be reticent on this. Uh, <laughs> uh, if, so, so, if you if you allow, I mean, I'm usually quite outspoken, but uh, I think this uh, political sensitivity on this. So, I am. Uh, let me be. Let me remain on a listening mode. Uh, this, uh, we won't hold that against you, I think. Let me let, let let us stand back a little bit further, though. And couldn't one paint a rather different picture of this year? I mean, I grant the Euro optimism and I'm revel in it. And I'm so glad that we're having this conversation and not some other conversation that looked like we might be having in May. But if you could look at it another way, like what something has happened today on both sides of the Atlantic. Effectively, we have central bankers on both sides of the Atlantic screaming for fiscal action. We have, we have uh, the Fed screaming for fiscal action. We have the ECB, Madame Lagarde, today, this afternoon, uh, AP had her saying, we need the funds released now. And of course, the funds can't be released now, and it's very unlikely they will be released immediately. But she has to say this. So what we have is the two advanced economy democratic blocks in which the central banks are carrying the burden of policymaking, and they are also carrying the burden of absorbing Italy's legacy debt and stabilizing that market, which mercifully they're doing, apart from a quick blip early on, they're in the game, so we're in the game. But another way of looking at this is that in the face of a manifest crisis with the epidemic sweeping across both the United States and Europe to levels which rival those of the spring, the only difference is we're better at managing the system in hospitals. Politicians, policymakers, democratically elected officials and neither bloc is capable of mounting a prompt, timely and large scale fiscal deal. In the American case, what, what this amounts to is regionally based opposition between a far right nationalist party with suspect democratic and legal credentials on the one side and a notionally elected democratic party on the other, which has not had its victory recognized yet. And is battling for control of the upper house, as we all know. And in the other case, we have a very elaborate statesmanlike deal that was done in July that does indeed move Europe forward, except with the hitch that a country of the size of Poland and a regime as nasty as that as Hungary are part of integral members of this system. And they have guaranteed rights within this structure to block any further progress. And they are, for their own reasons, doing precisely that. And so as opposed to a deal that we thought was done and dusted in July and to which the markets have extended the credit, which it deserves, we might be in a process that will go to December. And in the meantime, the reality of this is the money is not arriving. Yeah, I don't think any of us thought the deal was done and dusted in July. I mean, the procedural okay. steps were clear from the beginning. It was clear that the rule of law compromise uh, would lead to further uh, difficulties down the road because it was kind of papered over yeah. but uh, pretty ambiguous. Uh, it was clear that it would take several months to get it formalized, and that's exactly what's happening. Uh, so from a market perspective, I think the big question is, will they have a deal in the end? The expectation remains that, you know, a few months more delay doesn't change much, and the, uh, the good news is that the market is working. It's playing its role. It's providing bridge finance. And you have that into compressed spreads. So, so far, so good, I would say. And so far, from my perspective, and frankly, from the market perspective, no reason to worry. Actually, Italian spreads, despite the second wave, despite the deterioration in economic prospects, Italian spreads have gone down, not up, yeah. in the beginning of that sequence. And frankly, I don't see a reason to believe the market is wrong on that. And Greece is negative. But nevertheless, you could end up surely with a vision of this process in which, as you yourself say, Nicola, Rule of law is probably in the end watered down to the point of meaninglessness. And the central pillar holding this whole thing up is the ECB, which, as we know, has legitimacy issues of its own. Of no, its I, own. I, I mean, I, I'm playing devil's advocate. Yeah, here, yeah no, I, and, and that's very healthy. But, uh, but I see the two issues as different. 
so uh, if you assume the rule of flow mechanism to be weak, the central pillar remains next generation U. Yes, exactly. So then we, and, we, and we have a trade-off, if you like. We have a trade-off. I, I think in that's the what the that, markets care about, frankly. Yeah. They want to see union bonds. Yeah. They believe in union bonds. Um, they're expecting union bonds. Yeah. Um, they don't care much about rule of flow. You can say yeah. that's short-sighted. I agree. But you know, we have a unanimity rule, and that's no surprise. Yeah. Uh, and um, and you know, uh, the issue, and and frankly, I mean, there's still a contested election system in Poland, and even arguably in Hungary. Even so, it's less clear for Hungary. Mm -hmm. So you know, who knows what's the next step? Okay, maybe let, let me come in for a moment in this. Uh, okay, one consideration is that, um, uh, okay, let, I mean, what is happening is rather serious, you know? So I don't think we sh it should be brushed aside as, uh, uh, um, it's serious, you know, right? just, just a little, uh, so it is, it is a serious. It's not uh, a spat, challenge. right? No. And, and it is, so uh, I, am, uh, re I remain uh, optimistic about the final outcome. I do not know exactly what the outcome will be. They are also in discussion in, uh, in the media. You have different options. Uh, uh, the one uh, um, uh, that Nicola is stressing is one of the options. Others, uh, other options are being, uh, have been discussed also. I mean, I think uh, they eventually will find uh, a solution because um, because there is uh, you know Hungary and Poland that they have a, huge, a lot to lose in, in uh, huge uh, in percentage of GDP. Yeah. We are talking about uh, in terms of percentage points of GDP is uh, uh, the transfer in next generation EU is uh, uh, over the year so is is over ten percentage points of GDP for yeah. both. Yeah. So so here we are talking about uh, is not uh, blocking out of losing nothing. Uh, it is uh, blocking and and um, you know and and you know risk to lose uh, a, a huge um, uh, a huge amount. I think I'm confident that we are lucky enough in a sense that uh, we have uh, uh, the German presidency, uh, Mrs. Merkel, very committed, uh, very much behind the the July agreement. In fact, uh, I mean the Commission. You you remember the Commission proposals uh, of May were preceded by. Uh, Franco-German uh, uh, proposal, uh, which uh, which had even higher grants than what uh, we eventually had. No, but let me go, go back for a moment to what uh, uh, you started with, uh, um, Adam, and it is uh, the considerations on the monetary fiscal. Uh, yeah. So the fact that you have um, the two monetary uh, authorities across the Atlantic calling for fiscal action. I mean, this is, if you think about this, it's pretty unprecedented. Totally. I mean, especially yeah. on this side uh, of yeah. uh, where, I mean, and I actually, I mean, in the paper that uh, you mentioned that I uh, wrote at the, at the beginning of the year, uh, I, I said at the time as one of the lessons of the, uh, of the management of the, of the financial crisis was that um, we risk to have uh, Sargent and Wallace and uh, monetary, unpleasant monetary arithmetic on its head. Uh, it would be the, fisc the by excessive fiscal stringency that we actually coerce the central banks and yeah. and uh, and have actually fiscal dominance by via um, uh, fiscal uh, stinginess. Let's put mm -hmm. it uh, let's put it like that. Now, what I mean, throwing the ball to the future here, looking at what is happening on the two sides of the Atlantic, but in particular uh, on on this side. We are going to have uh, um, the two reviews of the monetary policy strategies and the fiscal strategy. So mm -hmm. the monetary policy strategy of the ECB, uh, that ongoing, and uh, we started at the beginning of the year, the review of uh, you know, six and two pack. So it means essentially macro surveillance in particular, the, Stability and Growth Pact that has been put on ice uh, with the uh, application of the general escape clause uh, for obvious reasons. In the next months, it will be restarted. Clearly, these two processes are in the institutionally independent, mm -hmm. but in terms of outcome, they must respect the coherence of, uh, you know, if you put it through my uh, 
a Monet triangle, the something at the end of the pipe has to come out in, in a you know in a consistent way. So mm -hmm. we will have to see eventually the two reviews as producing an outcome which is uh, which guarantees for normal times as well as for exceptional times um you know a coherent and um, uh, cohesive uh, policy mix mm. so this is i mean nicola come come in please yeah no i want to i want to make an additional remark on uh, one of the questions you asked which is you know the contrast uh, or or the comparison a uh, riser between the EU and the US and the risk for uh, politics to come in the way of the necessary fiscal expenditure that has been uh, announced or signaled. Um, so here I'm putting my head uh, above the parapet, but I, I see more risks there in the US than in the EU right now. Hmm, yes, I gather, yeah. So, so I, I, I think that one way or another, uh, and possibly with some delay, but not too much delay, the expenditure promise of next generation EU will be delivered upon, uh, not exactly in the form as announced, but, uh, but, but in, you know, kind of that order of magnitude. Um, for the US, I'm reasonably optimistic that there will be uh, an agreement on stimulus, but that's a much more debatable proposition, I think, uh, at this point in terms of probabilities, because it's linked to the future of the Republican uh, party in Senate, and 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 frankly, I don't think anybody has a clue of uh, what is going to happen there. So, in, intriguingly, um, the political predictability in, is on the side of the EU right now, uh, to a considerable extent. Uh, can we? Uh, thank you. This has been a totally fascinating um, conversation, and once again, the EU demonstrates its sort of uh, role as a laboratory, really, of thinking about politics and economics fiscal policy, the constitution making in the modern era. We've had this question from Ben Carlin, uh, at least on my chat feed, which is about own resources. So I wonder whether, I know these are future orientated questions and I fully understand and, and agree with the, the political tactics as if it were postponing this question. Um, but it would be great, I think, to get your views on the ultimate trajectory in that sense. So the question is, how important will the own resources decision be in determining the status of EU bonds as a safe asset? Is a dedicated revenue stream necessary to make this a paradigm shift and not a one-off? Um, okay, Ben, uh, okay. Uh, I salute Ben, uh, who we have been working together for, uh, uh, for a while. Um, so, uh, just for for just for information i mean the way it is built now the whole construction is uh, um an agreement uh, on increasing the ceiling of all resources so basically uh, the callable contribution of mm -hmm. the uh, of the member states and the space between uh, the spending and those callable uh, ceiling uh is actually the, um, the provides a guarantee for the for the yeah. issue of the bonds. So this, for information, the way it stands now. That's why it is very important uh, uh, to uh, conclude the negotiations uh, as quickly as possible, because uh, the uh, we have to go through most in most countries through national parliament ratifications of the new own resources decision. Mm. So we are not there yet. That's why uh, Commissioner Gentiloni this morning in, a, in an interview, um, he was confident that we'll find an agreement, but he was uh, starting to become uh, nervous about the, the possible delays on, uh, on mm. this. Let me add uh, uh, and uh, open and close the brackets immediately. We are not wasting our time now, huh? because what we are doing with the member states is that we are discussing informally with them the preparation of national recovery and resilience programs. Right. So that uh, this is uh, a part of the, of the uh, regulation of the, of the RRF. So they have the possibility, member states, to present uh, programs uh, in draft form. They discuss with us so that once they will uh, submit in at the beginning of next year, the uh, the final uh, version of the program it will have been already let's say digested 
uh, so that to ease the, uh, the adoption by the council in a speedy manner. So we are using, in a sense, on the sideline, the, um, the, uh, the time now for that. But oh, I think eventually the, um, the question of, uh, uh, and the answer implicit in Ben's uh, question is, uh, I think is right. Um, I think having uh, own credible own resources uh, at the of the EU budget uh, um, for the EU budget, I think will be will be important to underpin uh, the credibility of the uh, of the new safe uh, assets. Um, whether that will be for uh, those who want to repay uh, the bonds or those who want to, you know, in a sense, roll it over as. Uh, as uh, Nicola mentioned uh, at the beginning. So I think the incentives for the first time ever, I would say, because they, every seven years, the issue of new resources come back on the table. Huh? Every time we discuss the multi-annual mm -hmm. uh, EU budget and then runs into the sand uh, systematically. So I think this time there is an alignment of incentives to make sure that we will um, Put forward uh, uh, and and agree uh, new own a new own resource or new or or a, uh, you know portfolio of new own resources. Um, and as as I mentioned a bit en passant before, I think what we are trying to do, we will try to do in the course of next year, is to try to uh, align the new own resources with the uh, let's say basic uh, um, strategic objectives on the union in particular make it make it consistent with the with the environmental transition yeah. so that will be so carbon border adjustment uh, um, ets uh, uh, i think digital taxation also there is a lot many many balls on uh, up in the air it will depend also what uh, you know how the new u.s administration will position itself there is an ongoing oecd process uh, on this uh, but um, i think uh, uh, having uh, something which goes in that direction, I think, is um, it's an important uh, progress. It would be an important progress. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you to both of you for being so generous with your time, so generous with your ideas, for coming back to talk to us, as, as Marco has done, uh, really, for a, a long sequence of, of discussions now, and for bringing us good news this time. Uh, it's, uh, it makes a change from some of our previous moments of, of conversation. <laughs> Uh, to be talking in the terms that we are, um, whatever qualifications they may be. And it, it remains um, not just, I think, politically engaging, but also profoundly fascinating from an intellectual point of view to watch the making of history in this sort of uh, unfold before us. Thank you so much for coming. As we all know now, the worst bit about Zoom calls is the fact that you just have to sign off, wave goodbye to people. Uh, but please join me in, uh, in applauding, our, in applauding our, our two speakers. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And I look forward to doing it uh, better in future in, uh, in person. Thank Cheers. you, Adam. Thank you, Nicola. It was, uh, Stay well. Stay well. Happy to continue the tradition. Yes. <laughs> Stay well, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.